school board meeting under tight security tonight after a threat over masks. As Mesa County's election clerk waits to find out her criminal charges, her allies say another elections clerk copied election servers. He says, no, 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 I totally didn't do crimes. All this talk about illegal copies of our voting systems, what could somebody do if they got a copy? When the pandemic started, people headed for the hills. The hills were not prepared. And the story of a Colorado original. She got struck by lightning. She had six husbands. <laughs> she tended to 640 acres pretty much on her own. She raised a son by herself. What an absolute badass. Wish I could say that word on next. Good thing this is next, but before. A Jeffco school board meeting is happening inside a secured building tonight because of a physical threat against school leadership over the issue of masks. The head of security for the district says the threat was phoned into the superintendent's office. Jeffco schools currently require masks, but they're dropping that mandate in just a little bit on the 18th. The district headquarters has now been secured due to the threat. Nobody's allowed inside the building right now, and sheriff's deputies are there. The Board of Education study session was closed to the public and live streamed instead. So it's just the board and some school leaders alone in that room following the threat. Douglas County School Board is going to pay out nearly a quarter million dollars to its outgoing fired superintendent because the conservative board majority did not have a reason to terminate his contract. Today, a board member revealed they may try to recoup some of that spending by doing a smaller search for a new superintendent. Board Director Kaylee Winnegar went on talk radio today to defend the superintendent's firing, and she said that the district may not conduct a national search for a new superintendent. They may look locally only in order to save money. Winnegar admitted to 850 KOA, quote, obviously, we're not the smartest on timing on how all this worked out. After Mesa County Clerk Tina Peters' arrest yesterday for struggling with officers following a search warrant, fellow Republicans have said T Peters is being targeted for revealing election rigging. Close Ally said today that two other election clerks copied voting system data just like Peters did, which landed her under federal investigation. Today, one of those clerks tried to say, no, 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 I'm not involved in that stuff. Douglas County Republicans Clerk Merlin Klott says this was all a big misunderstanding. Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold's office started looking into whether Klotz voted, violated voting machine security after he appeared to brag about it on social media. Klotz told the Secretary of State that he used the wrong wording in trying to describe the system backup process. He said in an official response to the state's questions that he did not do anything illegal. A few minutes ago, Grand Junction police said that they have obtained an arrest warrant for what went down with election clerk Mesa, Mesa County clerk Tina Peters yesterday. It is for a misdemeanor obstructing an officer. They showed up at a bagel shop to take her iPad. A judge said she'd lied about taping a court session. So this is a misdemeanor for Peters on top of what is a felony investigation involving the court. So three Republican clerks have now been questioned by the Secretary of State's office about potential security breaches. Peters in Mesa County, Klotz in Douglas County, and Elbert County Clerk Dallas Schroeder. Peters and Schroeder admitted to copying hard drives and sharing that with people outside the county. They said they're trying to preserve evidence of the 2020 election. Got politics guy Marshall Zellinger wondering, what could you do with a copy of a voting server? This story is going to feel like the Matrix, because this is what you expect to see when hearing about potential computer security breaches. Republican clerks in two counties, Mesa and Elbert, have admitted to copying their election voting machine servers. If you understand how the program is, because you've got your hands on it, you can then start to go, how can I manipulate it for whatever my gains are? I reached out to Chris Roberts, a cybersecurity researcher and someone who gives presentations on cybersecurity. This part of one of his presentations on election security caught my eye. Anyone with physical access to a machine can install malicious software in less than 60 seconds. What this does with having access to the software and controls and everything I want is now just gives you the additional insight into going, okay, I know that when you walk in and you press this button, this is exactly the set of commands that occur. This is exactly where it goes. I know if I build a program that I can adjust it. After each election, before the results are certified, Colorado conducts what's called a risk limiting audit. A bipartisan team looks at random ballots from each county and compares them to how the scanner counts the vote. If the machine count was off, this would reveal the discrepancy. Since this started in 2017, Colorado has never found fraud. In our industry, in this computer security industry, we've been 
we've been working and trying to work with a lot of the voting systems for a number of years for, for all the reasons we're talking about now and a lot more. One other aspect of election machine security that you can use in everyday life, password complexity. Roberts said voting machines have been found to have really easy to crack passwords. So look at this chart from one of his presentations. For a secure password that will take lifetimes to crack, you want to be in the green area. If you're only using numbers, you need 18 to get someone guessing for 126 years. Just using upper and lowercase letters, at least 12 to have 600 years of protection. And with mixed numbers, upper and lowercase letters and symbols, use at least 10, and it should take almost a millennium to crack your code. I need to do my passwords again. This story is not to scare anyone, but it's eye-opening to know what is possible when you have people in positions of power that have access to the hardware and software. Douglas County is supposedly different than Mesa and Elbert in that Douglas County's clerk does not have direct access to the hardware and software because the county is so big that access is strictly for specific elections employees and not Clerk Merlin Klotz. When you have a situation, Marshall, where you have people like uh, former President Trump's advisor Steve Bannon saying we're taking over these election boards, these means of elections. They say they've got these allied clerks in Colorado on the inside on elections. How confident is the state that they could tell if somebody was messing with the machines? Based on those risk limiting audits, if you had the physical ballot that went through a machine and you had a random sample and you compared the ballot, the paper ballot and the computer count, if there was something funny with the computer count and you're looking at the ballot saying, wait a minute, this was supposed to have 10 for this candidate and this only shows five, then you would know something, assuming you don't have really sophisticated people doing something with equipment. And I don't wanna get too technical into it, but yeah. We believe, based on risk-limiting audits, we would know, we hope. Marshall, thank you. Want to follow up on a city council gone wild story that Marshall brought us last night. It happened as he suggested it was going to go down. Thornton City Council threw out one of its own members last night, voting along straight ideological lines to say that the woman doesn't live in Thornton anymore. City Council voted 5-4 to four to create a vacancy for Ward 1, the seat which was up until then occupied by Jackie Phillips. City Council elections are nonpartisan, but you know the deal. People pick sides. Thornton has a 5-4 to four conservative leaning board, and, and Phillips, Ward 1, was one of the liberal is in the minority. Conservative members decided she no longer lives in Thornton because she splits her time between that city and another home in Alamosa. And since they have the majority, they had the ability to boot her off. And they'll also have the ability to appoint her replacement to enlarge their, their majority. So work from home meant work from anywhere, provided that you had the means. And some people had the means to make a new home or a second home during the pandemic in Colorado's high country. That influx of people has taken a toll. Here's Anusha Roy. During the pandemic, I think there was a lot of soul searching. If our lives could be short, we might as well go to the place where that's going to make us happy. And a lot of people look to the mountains. San Miguel County, including Telluride, is on track to hit a record breaking number of visitors. Local residents who live on roads that might have gotten you know, 10 trips a day that are now seeing 200 trips a day. The surge of people is putting pressure on the county. The people who fix the roads and plow them during storms are being pushed out of the area as home prices went wild. Our real estate market history is sold over a billion dollars in, in 20. And since then, in 21, I think we're at 1.4 billion for total sales. While deed restricted housing meant to be more affordable is being built, it's all relative. You know, the last round of, of deed restricted product to come to the market was around a half a million dollars. So, so people started moving further out. When we do have things like snowstorms and we have to call out um, staff to respond, they're coming from an hour to two hours away. In Grand County, um, yeah, it's getting bad. And Commissioner Rick Chimino says the same scenario is playing out. The, the business owners are really scrambling to get workers. It's just, um, I don't know where the breaking point is. Revenue from tourism and property taxes are up, but that money is being funneled towards catching up on maintenance, not long-term changes. And while more affordable housing is being built, it isn't quick and it isn't cheap. And build the stuff overnight, so we're going to probably be struggling for years. 
So Chimino also said consider visiting the less crowded ski resorts or hiking trails to spread out the visitors. On, but on the flip side, though, they're also talking about how more visitors did help keep businesses afloat through the pandemic. And they were saying long term effect could mm -hmm. be that it could actually help diversify the economy in some of these communities as well. Different communities taking different approaches to deal with this. What's Telluride done? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple things they did. So the voters actually okayed putting some restrictions on short term rentals. That's a big deal there because so many of the houses are second properties, yeah. third properties, so they're not places people can move into long term. The other thing they did was actually cut down on the lodging tax, and that was money set aside specifically to go towards marketing Telluride. And they were like, we don't want it. You're marketed. Yeah, they were like, yeah. people like it, they know about it, we don't need to invite more people over. Better use of those funds maybe elsewhere. Interesting. All right, thank you, Nusha. Imagine for a moment what Colorado's first responders have seen in the last few years. Monster wildfires, mass shootings, the constant strain of the pandemic, and then all of those daily traumas, the stuff that first responders witness that don't make the news. That stuff takes a toll, both on first responders and on their families. That's why this week's Word of Thanks campaign supports the nonprofit Foundation 1023. That nonprofit provides peer support for first responders and also provides confidential funding for them to seek emotional and mental health support to deal with PTSD, and anxiety, and depression. Let me explain why this is particularly important. So many first responders have some form of mental health support that's available through their work. But there's a stigma associated with identifying yourself in the office as somebody who is struggling with the work. And there can also be a fear of professional repercussions if they ask for help. Foundation 1023 provides a confidential way for our first responders to get support. Support for them and for their families who share in their service and sacrifice. And the nonprofit offers this service all across Colorado. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 and I'll send you that link to donate. We know that even $5 matters and as always I'll match the first 50 donations of $5 to get us rolling. Colorado's first responders witness the worst moments in life, and they do it again and again. The least we can do is have their back when they need some help processing what they've seen. Denver Public Schools is dropping its mask mandate. Look at whether requiring masks in schools seems to have made a difference. She had this spirit that was so ahead of her time, and I'm sure a lot of other women at that time felt that, that way as well. The legacy of one of the baddest mamma jammas to ever call Colorado home. It's coming to a theater near you. Next. Denver Public Schools will be dropping its mask requirement in a bit more than two weeks. Announced today that DPS will lift the public health order requiring masks in schools and child care facilities on February 25th. DPS says it will end its district-wide mask mandate that same day. School board member Tay Anderson opposed dropping the mask mandate. He said at one point he would try to add it to the dress code if the city no longer required it. This morning, Anderson said he didn't actually have the support from board colleagues to make that happen. But do mask mandates work at this point in the pandemic? That's a controversial question that has been studied and restudied for a few years now. Locally, it's tough to look at the recent data and say that masks have made much of a difference with the general population. There does appear to be a difference, though, in schools. So take Douglas County, which did not implement a mask mandate. They did not differ all that much from masked up counties in a lot of key metrics like hospitalizations and the positivity rate when you compare Douglas County to Adams and Arapahoe. But then you look at what happened with kids. Douglas County is there in yellow, Adams in red, Arapahoe in blue. Douglas County saw much higher incidence rates in kids 17 and younger than the other two counties, like four to five times higher than Adams and Arapahoe, where Douglas County uh, did better was ages 18 and up. It appears that Omicron largely did what it wanted, regardless of individual masking rules in individual counties in Colorado. Another mild February day with clouds rolling in late in the afternoon, signaling the arrival of a cold front that will bring a little mountain snow tonight. Another storm could bring snow to Denver on Friday. Temperatures in the low 50s along the front range, running about 10 degrees above average. There's the chance that we'll see a few isolated showers in extreme eastern Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas tonight as the system rolls through. Once it moves through, though, sunshine returns. We have a beautiful day tomorrow. A few light snow showers in the high country, but not 
not expecting any winter weather or travel advisories. And so, moving you through the next couple of days, how about sunshine and 57 on Thursday, snow showers and 45 Friday, Super Bowl Sunday's beautiful, and for Valentine's Day, a forecast to love. It was worth the wait for Rattlesnake Kate, story of one of the coolest Coloradans in history, hitting the stage after a pandemic delay. This feels much more epic than what I had imagined when we first started this. The pause in production turned out to be a hidden blessing. Next. You know the band Lumineers. Their cellist left for a new project. Neela Carrick wrote a solo album based on the real-life legend of a Coloradan known as Rattlesnake Kate. Our KDE Eastman and photojournalist Mike Grady have the story. The marketing of Rattlesnake Kate is unconventional. They're calling it a badass new musical. And really, that's the most appropriate description for a story about a Colorado woman who killed 140 rattlesnakes and made a dress from their skin in 1925. But getting this story to its stage premiere in Denver, that took these two badass women, Karen Hartman and Neela Pekarik. <laughs> The show yeah. began as history that Neela would tell her friends. It feels like a like a party trick that got really out of hand. She then composed an album that this New York City playwright found inspiration in. The story just speaks to the way that women now are missing parts of our history and reclaiming those ancestors gives us more power. These two women saw more than a figure who gained fame from her battle with snakes. The, the rattlesnake encounter is the hook that, that brings you in, but for me it was, it was the research that I did beyond that about Kate that made me know this was not just one song, this wasn't just an album, this is so much bigger. When the pandemic paused the production, the show itself got bigger too. This feels much more epic than what I had imagined when we first started this. On the stage, the main character is played by three women. An intentional decision by women who saw themselves in Kate and hope others will too. And I think that's what the audience is responding to as well as a potential for a kind of unity that's not conformity, it's harmony. Badass in more ways than one. For next, I'm Katie Eastman. That show runs at the DCPA's Wolf Theater through March 13th. That could be the end of things. Maybe there's another theater picks it up. Neil and Karen said to get Broadway involved, it'd just take $20 million in an open theater there. So, hey, maybe somebody watching knows somebody. It's help for the first responders who don't hesitate to provide it for Coloradans. Our word of thanks group project for the week. And your feedback next. Hey there, next producer Kevin Larson here again. If you'd like to hear what Michaela Schifrin and her family have to say about her struggles in the slalom, tune into the Olympic Zone with Tom Green after next at 5.30. First responders are steeled to see the worst, and yet they still manage to get up the next day, go back to work, and then they go home to their families, hopefully without bringing the worst of the world in the door with them. As easier said than done. In comes the nonprofit called Foundation 1023, which offers peer support for first responders across Colorado, along with confidential mental health and emotional health resources. Scan a QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me in donating to help Foundation 1023 reach more first responders across our state. This is confidential help that is for both the first responders and their families, understanding that they are also exposed to the trauma and the stress of the job. Clarissa wrote in tonight to say, I'm definitely donating this week. Our son is a firefighter. She said they deal with so much. John Mertz notes about our reporting on Thornton City Council voting off a colleague because she had bought a second house and they said she was living there too much, wasn't a resident. He said, goes, you just proved yet again that nonpartisan elections are not. How do we fix that? There's been talk about party line votes in Colorado's municipalities. Hasn't gone anywhere so far. We'll see you next time.